<laughs> I only help people when I'm getting paid. Same. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. <laughs> that was actually sarcasm. Oh. Have you heard of it? Uh, no. Have you seen Inside Out 2 yet? No, I haven't. Are you interested in seeing it? Yes, I am. So I should not spoil it for you. That would be great. Okay. So here's what happens. I am Doug Friedman. I am Kenzie Janess. And this is Your Mental Breakdown. The podcast. Welcome I'm going in back. Hot. <laughs> Welcome back. Summer heat. Welcome back. Now you Welcome know what that is. Welcome back. <laughs> back. No, see, I'm changing into the song I know. Wait, but there's also another back song. Um, There's quite a few. There's Baby Got Back. Baby Got Back. That's it. Baby that really Got what you're Back. Of? Yes, that one. <laughs> and, and, oh, God, it's killing me. What is the other one? Oh, Baby Back, Baby Back. <laughs> I want my Baby Back, Baby no, Back. No, not baby that. Back, not that. I not want my Baby Back, that. Baby Back, Baby Back. That reminds back. me of Awesome Powers. I know, same. Always. Yeah. Those movies have not aged well. May I just add? Yeah. Yeah. Not good. Not a lot have. Not a lot. This is true. Yeah. But it was I finally sad. saw Inside Out too, though. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Oh, my God. By the time this airs, I will oh have. Oh, my God. You're right. Okay. So tell us all your thoughts about Inside Out too, Doug. Now you have to yes and this shit. Tell us everything. What's I like your the review? first one better because in the first one, see, that's how tell I can me. spin it. Yeah. No, good no, job. I can't do that. You don't remember anything. That was 10 years ago. <laughs> Was it 10 years ago? That was 10 years ago. You're kidding me. I just looked it up. Yeah. Wow. I know. I thought it was actually even longer than that, but no. And the main girl is only a couple years older. She's going through puberty now. And guess what emotions they've added? This is your pop quiz. Uh, What emotions they've added? What would they add to a 13-year-old going through puberty? You know, she already had joy, sadness, fear, Were they going with basic ones or is there going to be- They're getting a little more granular, but not by much. Angst. That would have been a good one. Do you say angst or angst? Who the F says angst? A lot of people I know. That can't be true. It bothers me. And I I don't correct them because it's just a a pronunciation or a pronunciation. No, it's not a pronunciation. (laughs) That's actually, no, that is incorrect. I will not take that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So jealousy? Envy. Envy. Yes. Oh, that's close. Envy. Yeah. Which uh, her role was to me. What about... uh, You'll never guess one of them. Embarrassment? Yeah. Really? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And he plays a pretty significant role. Okay. I mean, you would know. You've seen it already. So, (laughs) yeah. Who's your favorite? Wait, no, you keep guessing. Keep guessing. You're missing a big one. It's actually like they're the star of this movie, I'd say, besides Star? Mm Mm-hmm. Did we... we A new emotion comes in, new emotion enters the chat and takes over because we're in puberty. Oh, lust? Love? (laughs) Love. No. Oh. Ooh, geez. Look who's no, angry. Vitriol. Is it anger? <laughs> anger was already there. I know. I know. It's very close to fear. And some people are complaining that like it's too close to fear. But fear is maybe an immediate response to a more immediate threat. Whereas this emotion is more worried about the future. Oh, anxiety? Yes. <laughs> I thought that already existed. No. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Because she's 13 now. So now she experiences, I I know. See, this is my problem with Inside Out, which I'm asking too much of a kid's movie, like to have nuance, but like (laughs) you don't only experience anxiety for the first time when you're 13 going through puberty. I mean, it's truly like bulldozing, like whoop, here comes anxiety, embarrassment. And what do you think is the other one besides envy? Uh, You'll literally never guess it. Oh, I'll never guess it? No. Mostly because it's in another language. Oh, 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 it's uh, okay. Uh, Yeah, Uh I got it. I got it. It's ennui. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On we. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the character is like this depressive little like bored, French guy. like French looking guy who's oh, just oui. like listless oh. and like really flexible and just falling all over the place. But it's mostly for humor, I think, because he's like on his phone and just being an angsty little teen. Yeah. yeah. But that's the only other one that they added. Wow. So anyway, Inside Out, it's cute. It did make everyone in the theater cry. That was the best part is that everyone Aww. was crying, like audibly sobbing. It was wow. actually really touching how much everyone was sobbing because everyone can relate. Oh, totally. I loved the first one. Yeah. yeah. I can say, I guess now, because it's been long enough that everyone's seen it. Um, <laughs> right. Of course. And you too, Doug, right? You remember this part uh. where the lead up to the big, what? You don't want to hear it? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's not much of a spoiler. She has a freaking anxiety attack, like a big old panic attack. And oh, it is so okay. relatable and it's very touching. I won't tell you the next part because it really is a spoiler, I guess. It's sweet. Okay. I'd say the message is like, oh, mixed emotions. Uh, like we. they can all on we they can all get together. They uh, can all work together. I like that. Yeah, it's sweet. Okay. So we're back <laughs> with someone who has a, a baby. Yeah. Oh, that's right. At the beginning of summer? When was it that beginning we left of off? Summer, it was right at the beginning left of summer. Off at guess who has a baby? Drew has or is going to have. No, Wait, no Drew we, had he, the baby. He told well, the story. Right, because you said what? He didn't have the baby. <laughs> she had the baby. Because I have to be very said, literal. Well, they have a baby. They have a baby, yes. but she had the baby. That's right. Yes. We and have to get all the facts actually <laughs> comes into play in this episode. It really does. Yeah. yeah. Being a dad. This. What is a dad? <laughs> what makes a dad? That's kind of the theme here. Oh, man. One of them. And it's interesting because we've been working with Drew for a while now, mm -hmm. right? And he's walked yeah. through a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff with his parents. Yep. And now, mm -hmm. as he is a parent, and this is very, very new to him being a parent, oh, right? yes. that it brings oh, yes. up a lot of stuff about your own parents and your own relationships with them. Family. Right? What is a family? What makes a family? Whose role is what? And whoa, 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 whoa. Existential crises, as he calls them. Are All that stuff. Existential angst, yeah. angst. <laughs> I can't. That's it's, not right? Possible. It doesn't sound right to say it. It's not right because it's not right. Yeah. There are some objective truths in this world, and that's one of them. Really? It is existential angst, and I will <laughs> die on this hill. Wow. Mm -hmm. Anybody else saying different, you just aunt You're having it. Dead to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, okay. Aunt, aunt? Which one, which one are we working well, I with? I was going with aunt. Oh, oh, aunt. aunt. You aunt no having it. No one's saying aunt having it. I know. That's, that's I, my point. I, but I, I do aunt. say aunt, my aunt Kathy, not my aunt Kathy. Really? Yeah. And like auntie, not auntie. Uh, I'm auntie Kenzie. God damn I'm, it. <laughs> I'm very pro Kenzie. I'm all about Kenzie. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> we have a whole session to unpack. So maybe we should. Maybe we should we unpack. Should get... It is a big session. It's a it's, big old It's a good juicy... one to come back to with Drew because there's a lot yeah. that, that he's digging into and that comes up. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we will get out of the way and so listen to the session. Go so, like, subscribe. <laughs> Oh, look whatever. at you. <laughs> uh, you say this every time. I'm getting better at this, kind of. You made the world's worst segue last time. Can I just say that? Oh, it was, oh, it was with funny. The, the last one when he yeah, was having you a baby. Have like, a baby if you want to have a baby boy, go check us out on social media. Well, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, please was, explain yourself. Okay, what I was getting to was uh -huh. sometimes if you have like a question and you want to ask it, it feels like, Ooh, giving he, birth. Yeah, here's my <laughs> here's my little baby boy of a question. What? I hope they talk about this. It's Here still it a stretch. Is. It's still a stretch. But okay, <sighs> yeah. Send us all your baby boys and all your baby girls, even too, and even <laughs> neutral non-binary babies. Please send them all over. I would love to answer them. Questions, comments, mm -hmm. and as always, you can rate us, review us. Subscribe to us. D yep. Mm -hmm. uh, all those things to us. Email us like, at info email. at yourmentalbreakdown.com. Send us a handwritten letter. Yeah, we love those. I Kenzie's love home that. address is nope. <laughs> 123 Main Street. Oh, really original. <laughs> apartment one. Apartment one, A. Oh, apartment 1A. Oh. There we go. Perfect. Right? And that's it. Hey, and if you want one, <laughs> oh then God. listen up. To the session and we will be back to break it down for you in a little bit break it down break it down break it down now bye for now bye bye i guess i can ask how you are but i think first i'll go uh how's the baby good he's doing uh much better and i think i think same conversation that means i'm doing a lot better the only problem is he's up, up all night and sleeps during the day so we're trying to figure that out now. Oh, man. It starts early. And I think that kind of leads into to my feelings of guilt, too. Walking into this, we had a pretty set schedule as far as mom's going to stay at home with the kids, take care of the house. Cool. Right. I'm going to go right. to work. I'm going to provide. I'll handle that. She's been letting me sleep through the night. And there's like two nights ago, um, it was a rough night and he was just up all night. And uh, I'm a really heavy sleeper. Mm. And so uh, I woke up the next morning <laughs> and I was super refreshed. I woke up. I was like, wow, I slept like eight hours. Like that was crazy. And um, 
And she was like, yeah, like I tried waking you up and like you just didn't. And I was like, damn. Like, like ooh. Because mm-hmm. um, I, I honestly feel like, hmm, I know I'm doing my part and I just feel like I'm not doing enough. Like I asked her, I was like, yo, is it cool if I go to the gym today? Like I, I worked all week, kind of tired. I just want like a hour or two to myself to go get my gym session in. And she's like, yeah, totally cool. And then I'm walking out and she was like, kids leaving in like a couple hours. You didn't want to like do something. And I was like, oh, it kind of threw me off because we've been doing so like so good mm. and we've been super close. And, and I just kind of felt like what I said back to her was a communication thing. And I was like, I don't know what I don't know. And what I heard uh, was it was yeah. OK for me to go to the gym. And now as I'm leaving, it's not OK. And, and it's confusing me like, damn, am I even being like a good partner? Am I being a good dad? Am I doing what I should be doing? Um, and that's where I'm sitting right now. Yeah, I got two words for you, and I want I want you to riff on it when I say mm. it. I think you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Oxygen mask. Yeah, absolutely. Airplane. I feel like I can say the words to myself, I got to take care of myself before I take care of others, and I know that, and I think that's what I was trying to do by going to the gym this morning. It's making me think about like like a trust spectrum and me trusting myself and knowing what I need to do for my mental to be able to be here and take care of my family the way I think it should happen. Right. Done a pretty good job of taking care of myself over the last, you know, six months, maybe a year and really diving into what that is and, and not hmm, putting myself first, but being mindful of taking care of others as well. Cause I think that morally something that I stand for and I like doing, I almost think I have my mask on and and now she like the babies are asking for their mask on. I, I don't know where I sit in, in what that is because it, I'm I'm like in the gray zone as far as like, am I taking care of myself? Am I okay? Cool. Let's go handle this now. Right. And and I feel like I'm not handling that for whatever reason. I like being able to talk this out in the gray. This mm-hmm. is what it's about. I think, okay, maybe you've got your mask on. But he, the nose isn't quite fully covered. You know, you get, you got to pinch the metal around the nose to make sure it's covered, you know, and you're not yeah. quite there, but it's I'm good enough, I think. Mm-hmm. So now let me tend to girlfriend. Let me take care of the kid. And you're walking through a lot of unknown and it's not spinning you out like it used to. It's taking care of this stuff. And I think checking in with her too, as well as yourself, you're checking in with your therapist. Perfect. It brings me back to being, I was probably 14, maybe 15, and I went to church. And and I remember this one session, I don't don't even want to call it like a preacher situation, but it was like a a high school hangout kind of vibe. And and the point of that conversation was talking about being lukewarm in faith and where that is. And it's Hmm. it's almost better to either be red hot on fire or ice cold. Because in the two, yeah. you can somewhat yeah. learn something. Being lukewarm is, I don't want to call it a bad thing, but it's not where I want to be. I talk about spectrums and up and downs. I feel almost lukewarm about my participation in all of this. It's not that I'm not doing my part. And it's not that I'm going above and beyond doing too much to burn myself out. Um, and I think the feeling that I'm at is lukewarm. And it, and you're right, like it's not spinning me out and I'm not super happy and I'm not super sad and I'm not all over the place. I, f- I think in the last week or so, I, I really decompressed in the last two, three weeks of everything that happened. Now that I kind of got my head on my shoulders and I've gotten a couple of good nights of sleep, I feel like I want to push myself more in a couple areas. We talked a lot about courage and fear last week and, and mm-hmm. I almost mm-hmm. feel like I'm doing myself uh, I say it, do myself dirty. And um, hmm. over this last week, because I kind of let my fears outweigh my courage in some important situations to me, and they might be small, but like they were big in the moment to me. But one of those being like changing, uh, changing son's diaper after he got circumcised. And like, it just freaked me out. You know, I was like, holy fuck, what if I mess this up? What if I hit something I'm not supposed to? What if I don't apply the Vaseline the way right. I should? And he gets an effect and like, I go down the rabbit hole and it's, it, I mean, it's changing my baby's diaper. Like I've done it. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it a thousand times. Like it, it, I understand that. 
but I felt like in like the two, three times when I, I kind of passed them off to girlfriend, I was like, Hey, like, uh, it wasn't a situation where I was like reaching out for help in the community that we've talked about and, and looking for help. Cause I, I think that I should have been able to handle that. And, um, and there's been a couple of those type of situations where it's small, but it it's weighing on me in the sense of like, I don't feel like I'm all the way there. Yeah. Yeah. I can hear that from you. It made me think of something hearing you talk. I'm mm-hmm. going to put it under the umbrella of being too scared to make a mistake mm-hmm. or doing something wrong. Right. And you've talked about the, the lukewarm sermon before. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I loved it. I don't think I told you this at the time because we were talking about something else, but at, I remember you telling me that and thinking, and when I was studying religion at, at UCLA, I had a professor say to me, um, atheists are more similar to Christians than agnostics. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what? And he said, because they have strength of conviction. Right. An agnostic hasn't made up their mind. Mm-hmm. They're undecided. They don't know. There's something different in having some uncertainty and you just don't know and you're in the gray and I, I, I don't know. And, and there's, there's a powerlessness in that. Mm-hmm. I think there's a power in having a conviction, having the strength of your conviction and sticking to it. And you can change your mind. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And I hear a lot of what you're talking about in terms of changing a diaper and doing something. I don't want to do it wrong. You know, so I'm just going to kind of be in that limbo. And it's, you're neither being an atheist or a Christian. Right. If you were a Christian, I would change the diaper and I would just do it. And there it is. Right. And if I'm an atheist and I like, Hey, girlfriend, can you change the diaper? I, I can't do this. There might be a way to soften both of those and still acknowledge the, I'm worried about getting it wrong. Can I watch you do it? Can you show me? What do you think of this? It's getting some support. And back to this old gem, it's having a little bit of a safety net around you. So you're not up there on the tightrope or the hot air balloon feeling like I might make a mistake and plummet Mm -hmm. or the kid will plummet or something. I think you hit it with the safety net. And I think it's easier for me to look back at situations like this and be like, oh yeah, like I should have just said, let me watch you or, or can you watch over me as I do it to make sure that I do this right? And I think I need to take what that thought process is into the the day to day of what I'm going through now. I think what I can do is is be more more on the communication level with girlfriend in this and and kind of tell her where I'm at. And we I think we we do a really good job of of sharing our feelings of where we're really at and and what we need from each other. Yeah. Okay. And and I think now I can take that and and more so apply it to some. Think so tonight we planned a little date night for ourselves because we just haven't in a while and and we're just gonna spend some time and kind of hang out and sit and stare at each other and I'm really excited for that because I think we need it I know we need it and I like the headspace I'm in too as far as not spending and not free falling and trying to grab at shit you know I'm also weirdly enough really excited to kind of challenge myself to hmm I'll be a better dad because I think I'm doing a pretty good job. But at the end of the day, I'm also switching gears a little bit. Um, I'm really excited for these last two weeks that we've had. And I'm really excited for how I went through it. And I'm going through it. And I, like I said, I decompressed and I kind of thought about a lot of stuff. And and this was by far the hardest thing I've ever done. And then we just started. It's like, holy shit, you know, the unknown of what my future is. And I don't mean my future like 10 years from now. I mean my future as in like what's happening this afternoon. And what's going to happen with sun tonight and and what, you know, like it's real, it's like real time future tripping. It's new for me. And and you hear me kind of spewing still because I'm, I'm trying to get my, my thought processes of what these mid grade lukewarm feelings are and trying to describe that. Cause I, I think I'm really good at describing, oh, I'm devastated or I'm really happy and I'm really excited. I think I struggle with the, the lukewarm feelings that I'm going through right now. Hmm. What happens when you struggle? What's, what's the narrative? What, what are you telling yourself? Oh, I think, I think I've said it before in the sense of like, it's a challenge and, and I'm, it's more of an opportunity. And I almost liked being in the negative in the devastation because I liked learning oh, yeah. so much. Right. And I'm, 
I'm happy I'm out of that mindset and that thought process because I don't think that was very healthy. Yeah. But um <laughs> right. And even like with my parents, you know, like they're we're talking, they still haven't really came down. We haven't FaceTimed much since like the first week and, and I sent them pictures here and there and that's awesome and yippee ki yay. You know, I'm I'm struggling with my mom too because it's like I want my mom to come down here and I want her to see my grandbaby. I think or her grandbaby. I think we talked about this last week, um, mm -hmm. but it, it's still on my mind and I'm still going through it. I'm very confused as far as ha how to handle the situation of like, yeah, mom, come down or no, don't. And then I future trip of like, okay, if they wait till holiday, he's gonna be four months old by then, five months old by then, and you completely missed out. Okay, full circle. I take this back to changing the diaper. I'm not trying to miss out on anything. And I and I think I'm trying to smell the roses so bad that I'm only focused on the roses. And I'm not looking yeah. up and I'm not seeing the hummingbird that's flying by and I'm not seeing the sky that's blue. Yeah, and that's, you know, we talked about seeing the forest for the you can't see the forest for the trees. Like there's there's like three trees in front of me and I'm dealing with those trees and that's it. That's all I can see. Funny, I might have told you this once before actually. A kid I worked with, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, like eight years old at the time, and foster kid moved around a lot. He, I said something about being in the moment, and he said, well, the moment's over. As soon as you said that, that moment now is in the past. Mm. So there really is no present. Mm. And I'm like, dude, you're eight years old. You're <laughs> pulling out like freaking college philosophy stuff. What's going on? Yeah. Right? And we talked about it, and I kind of said, well... What if a moment isn't just that one specific pinpoint moment in time? Mm -hmm. What if being present might mean for this conversation? And what if being present might mean for this, you know, hour long session that we're having? Maybe it's present for these few months of the baby's first months here. Mm -hmm. This time period is this moment. Yeah. You know, we keep expanding a moment a little bit so that being present for the moment isn't just, am I fully present every second of every minute of every hour of every day? Right. That idea of expanding a moment. Boy, I just saw you smiling. Tell yeah. me. Go ahead. Um, well, when you said it was, you know, uh, being present for days, this, that, the timelines like that, I think it, it two things. I think one, it's very overwhelming when I think about being present for a whole month instead of expanding like a little pinpoint moment and expanding what that is. And I think that goes back to like our first day of having a good hour, having a good day, having a good month, having a good year leads to a good life. <laughs> right. I like expanding the moment, not have a good month. Yeah. Have a good month is like, well, what? And we, you know, we'll break it down into... What appointments do I have this month? You know, what what days are happening? Who am I seeing? What's going on? And in a month, your son is going to look like this and be this far. But if we just expand that pinpoint moment a little broader, mm -hmm. it gives you a little more room. Even you taking care of yourself, putting the mask on and, and adjusting the nose piece is going to the gym today. Mm -hmm. And maybe like in that moment of I'm going to go to the gym today girlfriend is like, oh, but what about this? We need to, like, okay, well, let me expand my moment a little bit. Mm. I will go to the gym today. I will also do this thing for you. Both are important to me. Right. Like I'm really sitting on expanding the moment and I really like what that is. And I think that helps with my, cause I have so much unknown going on right now that it's, uh, yeah. and while you were saying all that in my head, I was thinking about 10% disappointment too, and allowing space for what that is in that moment. Yeah. That's helping me with the change in the diaper, you know, and, and kind of throwing that 10% into the the whole mix of, of my last two weeks. I feel less down on myself because if I look at the last two weeks as one moment, yeah, no, I'm, I'm present and I'm doing pretty good. Right. Yeah. It's great. And dude, you are in... <laughs> very, very early stages of having a baby. Yeah. You know, baby brain is real. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, know, God, sleep yeah. deprivation is gnarly. Yeah. I like what you just said because it, it, it made me click. I feel like this whole conversation, I've been focused on 
I mean, I mentioned girlfriend, but I think the focus of me talking about girlfriend has been for son. I want to be a good parent, I want to be a good dad, but I also want to be a really good partner. And I think, I think my mindset has kind of shifted so much into son that I'm staring at him as a rose. And, and I need to compartmentalize both of those things. The lukewarmness of what I still feel while I'm saying all of that is, mm. this isn't what I expected. We talked about prepping and reading books. And I think I walked yeah. into this more Green Beret than I did Boy Scout. Yep. And it's not what I expected. How so? I love my babies. I love my family. I think I'm comparing it almost to my attachment to my mom when I left home and what that mm. felt like. Watching my mom and dad leave me as I kind of broke away and started my life and started this crazy adventure I've been on the last five, six years. And then I look at my first couple of days with son and how intense those were and understanding what love was and is. And now I almost feel like it's a drug of me trying to chase what that feeling is. In my core, I feel loved. I feel I'm loving. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's, it's not as intense as I thought it would be. Intense how? Crippling, you know, crippling love. Yeah, yeah. How do you make sense of that? I got, I got my idea, but I want to hear your idea first. I think what my brain tells me is that I'm in a much more stable position in my life emotionally and mentally and physically and all of that. Um, but what my emotions tell me is I'm doing something wrong. Hmm. How, how is that? I'm in a better place, but I'm doing something wrong. That's why it's still, it's not as intense, but there's still something. I don't know. I, I can't explain what that doing something wrong is. I'm doing something wrong. I'm not being there enough. I'm not being supportive enough. I'm not being, um, I'm not worried about my mom as much. I'm not building my career as much. I'm not the one feeding him from my breast. I don't know. I'm throwing these things out there. They're not necessarily true, but I'm looking for what that idea of doing something wrong. I think the one that hit me, and this might be this might be kind of weird, but the I'm not feeding him from my breast. She carried him for nine months. She pushed him out. She's the one feeding him. She's staying up all night. She's hanging out all day. And I get a hold of him for like a couple hours a day. Well, and, and usually like he wakes up and starts crying and I try and pick him up, but he's hungry. And so it's like, I can't even really calm him down. It's like, I, I hold him for a couple minutes. He looks at me, he calms down for like two seconds, starts crying again. I'm like, oh, okay, he's hungry. Boom. And then middle of feeding, she's like, oh yeah. And he pooped his pants. I got to change him real quick. Boom, boom. And, and I'm just kind of there. Yeah. What hit you as you said that something shifted in you? I feel like I'm checklisting myself. And as I go down the checklist, I'm knocking all my boxes that I thought that I would check off, uh, going green beret with it. On paper, I'm doing everything I think I should be doing right, correctly, and it's still not enough. Yeah. I think the idea is, okay, I went into this green beret, and now I'm realizing there are a lot of things I don't know, and I'm feeling ineffective. Mm -hmm. Not wrong, just not as effective as I'd like to be as a father, as a partner. Yeah. And there's, there's a reason why I said you're not feeding the kid from your own breast. It's a very common feeling. The mother is absolutely necessary. Sometimes it's an incredible burden as well as a, a joy and beauty of life to be the food machine. Right. Maybe your job in that is to be as supportive to her supporting the baby. Yeah. We already hit the part where you're putting the oxygen mask on yourself. Cool. You might need to go, okay, how can I help adjust hers? How can I help adjust his? Mm -hmm. Do I need to adjust hers so she can do his? Okay. Then that's my role. She's had a kid. I haven't. Right. 
I don't really know how to do this stuff. She does. It's easier for her to do it. Okay. Can I learn? Can I support her? What can I do to feel like an effective partner? Yeah. I have thoughts that just come, right? And one of those thoughts was, sure. I'll, I'll let her handle newborn because she's been through this. I can't wait till he's 12, 14 months where I got him and I can really dive in and I know how to handle that and I can do what that is. Right. And simultaneously, that same thought process, kind of like hand in hand going parallel on like a road, railroad track with it, was, oh my God, I don't want to miss out. I only get newborn stage for two, three, four weeks. Right. It was a like a paradigm shift in my existential anxiety of of mom and dad, grandparents now shifting over to my baby. And I want my baby to know that I'm okay in all of this. And I know I'm okay. Uh, I know I'm safe. I know I'm good. I know I'm stable. I feel like this one's three years coming. I want to deal with my mom. And I want to deal with mm. why that shit affects me so much. And as I'm understanding my love for son, I somewhat get a glimpse of my lo- mom's love for me. I always start with, she's such a good mom, but, or I love her so much, but. When I sit back and kind of look at it, I got a lot of dirty dishes with my mom and I keep adding more because I don't want to clean them. Okay. Riff on this. It's not your sink. What do you think I mean? I think it's my mom's sink. I think that's what you mean. I don't know if I agree with that. It might be my mom's sink, but it's the dishes I left while I was living there. And and I... Ah, what are those dishes? Let, let's hit that. Going back to my, my thought versus my heart, I know... I'm, I'm, I guess I know I'm supposed to think that none of what my mom was my fault and she has her own issues and it's a lifelong thing and it's a lifelong process and she got herself there. These are her choices. Emotionally, I, I also put her through a lot. And as, as I grew up, I, you know, I, it's not a burden, but I, I also don't believe it's all on her. And I, I'm a human too. And I played a mm. role in her life as a kid. And as I grew up, we grew apart. And the dirty dishes I left there were more so the conversations I didn't have. And it's gotten yeah. to a point now where I, I don't even know really what's wrong. With her, with you, with both, with the situation? With our relationship? feel very surface level relationship and I feel like it's very transactional. Yeah. And I've caught myself doing that with him and I've caught myself, you be a, be a good boy with mommy. I'll buy you this. And, and I've caught myself in my instant thought. Once I say it once, Oh, but this isn't, I didn't buy you this cause I love, like, this isn't me buying your love. And and I try and he's fucking four years old. Like he, he has no idea what I'm trying to say. No, but you're working your shit out. You're seeing it. This is why relationships, not just the romantic relationship, but relationships with other people are the mirrors for us to see ourselves and Mm -hmm. to see our issues. And we're talking about it. The relationship with your mom was built on dependence and codependence. Mm -hmm. If she's taking care of you, she's taking complete care of you because you are dependent and together you are codependent and it's built that codependence. And as you have become more independent and more self-sufficient, you don't need her all the time. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to be there for her all the time. Mm -hmm. And you're becoming okay with that. But it shifts the relationship. Similarly, she knew how to handle you when she was taking care of everything. Then it was, oh, by the way, you're cut off. Mm -hmm. To just kind of help you out and be there for you when you need it, that's foreign to her. She's not good with that. Right. So you guys haven't established that relationship. And you're looking at, what did I do to contribute to that? I'm putting dirty dishes in her sink. I would say the actual sink itself is clogged. Mm -hmm. That's her sink. 
I think for you, I don't hear your, your codependent need to go out there and take care of the dishes and unclog the drain and do everything. Mm -hmm. I do hear you seeing that that's the way it is and wanting to do something about it and feeling guilty that you put dishes in there at all, Mm -hmm. considering. Yeah. What can you do about it? What do you want to do about it? I don't know if I want to do anything about it. Yeah. And I I think... I think I'm becoming okay with what that is. I think, like, no, it's not. But yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And yes, it is. And I think it's it's, it's kind of opening my eyes to my relationship with my brother, too. It's almost something that's comedic to me at this point because of everything that's happened in the last 20 years. I texted him, yo, you're an uncle, like, yay. And he wrote back uh, something along the lines of, uh, so happy for you guys, congratulations, like double exclamation point. And in the card, my brother wrote exactly verbatim what he texted me. Like (laughs) there was effort and like, I appreciate what that is, but I think that's like exactly what I'm trying to say as far as surface level and, and, and like take it a step further. Like, you know, my gift giving thought process and what that is. I'm not trying to just okay it because they got us something. I'm okay with having that 10% disappointment, having like a 50% of like, oh, they were thinking about us and wanted to do something nice. And then kind of that last 40% yep. of like, well, they don't even know us. Like they're they're trying, they put the effort in, but at the end of the day, like I want a relationship. I don't want a book. That's a lot that's out of your control. You can't yeah. control how he is towards you and and what kind of room he has to put you in for his life, mm-hmm. right? And that's rough. And I, I think that you're in a much better place than you were a few years ago with him, okay? And this is something that you're thinking will bring him closer, will bring him in so I can feel family more. Okay, but this is the family you got. I think it's opening my eyes of what I truly want family to be. Ah, I feel a transition as far as being okay with the family I have and understanding what they are to me and where they fit in into my life. It feels like a puzzle. Like nice, they're in their place, and this is this is that. Um, now yeah. taking full conversation, full circle. I am so invested into girlfriend, son, and kid. It was my family. That when she says stuff like, oh, well, you're going to the gym, like we should be doing this, it holds so much more weight because of me not wanting to be in the same puzzle as my brother and my mom, two girlfriends, son, kid. Which brings me full circle in this is you feeling like you're not doing enough because your son is not feeding off of your breast. Right. Okay? How can I support my partner, mm-hmm. the mother of my child? How mm-hmm. can I support her now? What can I do? Yeah. Not Mm. to put the mask on her first and not me. Yeah. It's to recognize the priorities. The the big part of like, there are a lot of things I just don't know. I haven't been here before. And I'd like, I'd like to see, I'd like to learn. I'd like to, to feel more effective. And part of the reality was that (laughs) you're just not as important in a baby's (laughs) life as the mother. Yeah. That's fact. You can still be effective and supportive. Mm -hmm. You just kind of have to find it Mm -hmm. or ask and offer. Yeah. Yeah. And I I like that word effective because I feel ineffective. And I, I am, I'm really excited for tonight and to kind of sit down and, and talk and go through what effectiveness is to us. Because my effectiveness could be yeah. different than her effectiveness, too, as we're talking about that. And I want to be mindful of not being effective for myself in virtue of being effective totally. for her. The conversation with her can be great because it's what makes me a better partner to you right now. You know, I mm-hmm. want to be effective for you. Yeah. So what does that mean? Because whatever you're doing is feeling not effective for the baby, not supportive to girlfriend. 
mm-hmm. and not really restorative for you. Right. So you can find that. Yeah. By virtue of talking with her about it, you don't have to guess at things. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Cool. Hell yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I was going to just say, hell yeah. (laughs) We're back. We're back, baby, with the hell yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. those all summer of course right and can i get a hell yeah for communication yeah not mind reading (laughs) Woo! not making assumptions that little bit always reminds me of i just watched a rom-com the other day and it's just so funny how everything could be solved in a rom-com most movies actually if we just didn't mind read and we just talked to each other yeah like all the suspense would be gone you do literally Uh have your thinking cap on right now i do thank you so much i'm wearing my very cheesy etsy hat (laughs) i got it for troy thank you i thought you would like it troy was like that i can't be seen wearing that and i was like what why I this think this is why I wish we were doing video right now because it's you wearing a cap that says thinking cap <laughs> Thank and on you. the back <laughs> it's not important <laughs> it says not thinking not thinking but I'll never wear that because I am never not thinking I'd have to be dead <laughs> nor would you ever wear a backwards baseball cap that's most important actually yeah. yeah yeah so anyway back to Drew here's my first question and it's because we were just talking about it but like His whole thing with effectiveness, I know he opens with that and how he's not feeling adequate as a partner or a dad, but do we not want to get into some sort of reality testing to see if that's even true? Because is it just his subjective perception that that's true? Because at the end, it's like, you're kind of just reiterating like, yeah, you don't feel effective right now. So what can you do differently, right? How can you be effective? When really I'm thinking, well, whoa, 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 whoa. How do we know that he's actually not effective? I think you're right, or you're not wrong, depending on which way you want to look at it. (laughs) Okay. All right. I'll take it. Right. (laughs) It's a win in my mind. Sure. Absolutely. (laughs) Because that way of thinking and going at it is looking at, wait, you're holding this thing as a truth. Yes. Let's look at that. That might be a distortion. Let's reality test that. Maybe that's not true. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was one thing. I was hearing something a little different different yeah as we what were, were you getting this, because right? i know that's a very classic cbt sort of reality sure. testing like oh but is that even accurate but it's like sometimes cbt i think stops short because it's like does it matter if it's accurate it's the fact that he feels ineffective yeah if i just went to that i mm-hmm. would be dealing with the one thing that he brought in like here i'm feeling ineffective are you really oh maybe you're not oh, okay right no, we I'm would not. have like spent too much time dissecting the accuracy of that statement yeah and it yeah. would have been just about that statement true or false versus right. where we were coming to which i really liked this for him that a mm-hmm. lot of the episode was about talking this out in the gray well that's where it all starts right he's right. talking about being lukewarm and what i heard and heard what i heard and all that <laughs> <laughs> what i hear what i hear uh-huh. what i hear in the being lukewarm conversation and i want to know what you think about this obviously as oh always. i will tell you as always Doug. if i can borrow your cap no you're not no. allowed this right. cap is saving my <laughs> appearance at the moment. <laughs> no, uh, no, it's not. But hey, keep going. <laughs> hey, see how rude he is to me? That's going to get cut for That's sure, That's because I missed right? you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm making up for lost time. Right. <laughs> Speaking of lost time. What? Get to your point We're already. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Being lukewarm. Yes. I have a lot of thoughts on this because it relates to a couple other things he was talking about where... The middle, the gray area is yeah. actually kind of uncomfortable for him, right. which it always makes me think of this quote. It was in the context of eating disorder recovery, but hmm. I think it relates to almost everything where extremes are easy. Balance takes practice. Yeah, Like being yeah. on either side of the spectrum is so easy. And you kind of get to this with the atheism, yep. agnosticism thing where it's right. like having a really strong conviction. It almost gives you a sense of power or control and it feels really strong it feels certain it's it's power and control yeah and i think that's the discomfort is the gray area is meaning uncertainty really and not having control or giving into that powerlessness and that's a scary place to be yeah he's there in multiple ways so my other part of that i guess and maybe diving a little bit deeper into it is i feel like there's a part for him that maybe we didn't get to today but will surely come up i'm sure and maybe you've done it before where he used to kind of be addicted in a way, and I'm using that word in quotes, but like Uh really 
into the challenge and having those extreme feelings and the drama and the chaos of it all, right? Right. And we see it all the time where the gray area, the lukewarm is so uncomfortable because it's not familiar and we don't know what to do with it. We're like, I need chaos. Like I need something to latch onto. And this feels like unsettling almost. Yeah. I'm going to take a slightly left turn. Yeah, please do. I'm going to arc left a little bit. Mm -hmm. Something about that lukewarm or that gray Mm -hmm. in the, I guess, positive sense is middle and is balance. Yeah. In the not so positive sense for Mm -hmm. some clients, some people, Yeah. that's flat. Mm. Right. A lot of people think about taking a mood stabilizer. Right. And they don't like that idea, especially people with bipolar. Yeah. They don't like the extreme lows. Yeah. Unless they're very creative people and they go, oh, when I'm depressed and when I'm this, I can create this incredible Mm -hmm. art, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is. Yeah. But those highs, oh no, don't take those away from me. Yeah. Well, I I don't want to be a zombie. Like I want to be me, right? I want to be the highs. And And to me, that's almost the oxymoron extreme middle. Mm, I don't mm-hmm. want to be a zombie. Yeah. I don't want to be flat. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So yeah. there's almost three extremes. There's mm-hmm. the extreme low, extreme high, and extreme mm. middle. Mm. And that one yeah. is, I'm a zombie. I'm on we. I'm, I'm this. <laughs> and, and, that's, right? yeah. mm-hmm. and that's not where anybody really wants to be. No. So I get it, right? Because on one hand, I'm like, yeah, it takes the excitement, the novelty out of life, not having highs and lows. Right. But at what point is it <laughs> detrimental to have that as like a tendency or a pattern that you've grown so familiar with that it's impossible to just be in right. the middle. Even that, the patterns that we get so familiar and comfortable with mm-hmm. are something we need to reevaluate. Because yeah. if we're used to extremes, mm-hmm. then we won't recognize all this mm-hmm. space in the middle. Yeah. And even in the middle, there are highs and lows for sure. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah, you're not, there's no actual balance or middle area. Like right. it's a spectrum and you kind of wax and wane and ebb and flow, but right. there's not an actual point of like, this is 50% right. Right. exactly. That's what I say all the time. Balance yeah. is not that center point and it's not the seesaw of going from high to low and high to low. It's finding a range in the middle. It's that, you know, where the pendulum swings back and forth. It's okay, yeah. but find that middle area. Right. It's like homeostasis almost, just like the baseline. Sure. Are you the one who says that it's like running back and forth very quickly between the seesaw or is that the opposite of what you're saying? No, I don't that's say kind of that chaotic. because that is chaotic. Even <laughs> that would be an example of somebody of still chaos, yeah. doing what's comfortable in the chaos, mm-hmm. running yeah. back and forth. But I'm in this middle section, right? So yeah. I'm doing it right, right? Mm-hmm. Like on average, <laughs> right. I am in the middle, but right. I'm going very quickly between the two. Yeah. I don't because think that's balance. No, it's not. It's balancing, but it's not balance. Mm. Yeah. For Drew, a lot of what we are trying to look at is where Mm -hmm. can you be comfortable in this area? I mean, even thinking about he has no sense of taste, right? What? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, 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 wait. wait. What do you mean? Taste like style or he can't taste flavor? (laughs) He has a sense of style. He's He's a a fashion designer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was confused by that. Actual taste buds. Really? Yeah, going back to something. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. We used to talk about how Thanksgiving was one of his least favorite holidays Whoa. because there's all this food. And he's like, I can't taste any of that. Okay. And this is why he likes fast food, burgers, yeah. right? Because it's like, fuck it. If, if there's something like anyway. really oniony, then maybe he can taste that. You know, and I said I to him that. way, way back early on in the podcast, I was yeah. like, oh, I, I didn't realize that. That's, mm. oh, so you probably like Caesar salads, like with the really like, yeah, garlicky lemon. Right. Yeah. Right. Strong. That, yeah. Flavors. He could get that. Ooh. He had reverse COVID effect where he actually had a sense of taste for a while. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, I'm sniffing an analogy here then. Is that where you're going with this? Oh, because you're going sense of taste, (laughs) sense of smell. Nice segue. And sense of emotion or like (laughs) the chaos. So the the idea for him as he is familiar, Mm -hmm. his middle is very flat. I don't know what this is. I only know it if it's so this or so that. Yeah, like that's life. That's experiencing things as if I'm really high or really low. The middle is like boredom. It's like, what? Right. (laughs) What am I doing? Right. And he's the one that brought up lukewarm, which I loved. He was relating it to an analogy Mm -hmm. that he heard about- Oh, yes. At church, right? Yep. Where they were talking about being lukewarm in faith. So he was saying it's better to be red hot on fire or Mm -hmm. ice cold. Right. Mm. And that's that's why I brought in mm-hmm. the agnostic yeah, versus atheist, right? Because it's speaking his language, going with his analogy. <laughs> but you went your language too, a little secular, <laughs> the secular version. <laughs> right. But it works. I like that. Yeah. And he got it. Now he's kind of looking at it for himself, like, okay, well, what does that mean? And where is that? And and where am I here? I think what we are witnessing for a lot of this session is he is actively 
taking one of his values mm -hmm. and re-evaluating it. Which one are you talking about? The extreme thing. Like I need it to be this oh, or that. I see. Okay. And he's applying it to a lot of different things. Yes. Right. Trying so he's to live in the gray. He's be, taking that. Yeah. Oh, right. I learned that lukewarm is not good. You need to be either mm -hmm. red hot or ice cold. Yeah. So I've learned this yeah. and huh, let me re-evaluate this yeah. value. Right. And that's coming from his religious background, but also I think the family dynamics and just what he's used to seeing and being around is the heightened exactly. emotional, like this is living, this right. is life, this right. is what's familiar. And he says at one point, this struck me, he wants the crippling love, crippling right. Right. love. Yep. Like yep. mom, <laughs> right? right? Like, but it's more settled, you know? And I think he's almost uneasy because this gray area, this lukewarm is, whoa, I'm a father now. And that high, right. high is already done. And now it, the dust is settled. I'm in it. And what do I do with this feeling? I'm right. not used to this. I thought I was going to be crippled with love. Right, right. And that goes into, again, him reevaluating this and looking at that because mm -hmm. for him, I didn't carry this child around for nine months. I didn't push yeah. it out of me. I'm not right. breastfeeding. So yeah. I'm not doing enough. I don't have that crippling love. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to early relationships for him. Oh, yeah. Where he felt like he needed to give gifts and go over the top right. and be yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah. And, and everything. that was crippling love. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. actually might be loving is, oh, let me support my partner who's doing all of these things. Right. It's kind of funny how it's actually so simple, but it's not easy. No, especially not if you have a lifetime of... Yeah doing it this the other way, way, right? Yeah. And that's become so yeah. familiar, so ingrained. Mm -hmm. Those are the ski trails that are so yep. well grooved that right. that's where you just automatically go. Yeah. It feels like not enough to just be a supportive partner, which is right. really all he can be in this moment. It's kind of like this trickle down effect, right? If he takes care of himself, I know you mentioned the oxygen mask yep. thing, like yep. take care of yourself, then you can take care of your partner and then your partner can take care of the child, right? Totally. Like, and it's not that linear, but that's no, and kind he's, of what you're saying. And the way that his value yeah. system has previously been set up is mm -hmm. I need to take care of everybody everyone else, else, everyone yeah. on the plane, put on this, then I'll the put on a mask. Yeah, 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 right? exactly. It's interesting to walk through it with him and look at, I'm mm -hmm. trying on these new values. I'm seeing like, oh, maybe I can kind of change mine a little bit. And then mm -hmm. we went into the idea of a moment. Yeah. I was just about to get to that. Go for it. Because I really, I really like this. I have not heard about it this way before. We've talked about mindfulness kind of, and I don't even think you use the word mindfulness in this episode, but right. it's so funny. You brought up the eight-year-old and you said exactly what I was thinking. I was like, how the F is an eight-year-old going there? <laughs> like, oh my God, I would hope right. my eight-year-old child would be like that. <laughs> the moment is over. Every moment is over. What is the oh, present man. if it's always in the past? And I, I'm like, I still, oh. can I tell you just for a yeah. second, talking about this eight-year-old, yeah. I mean, this was a kid who was in foster care and I was working yeah. with him down in South LA. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing because the kid has been bounced around so many places. We were having a conversation about why do I want to bother making friends here? Oh. because they're not going to last. I was just yeah. going to get moved around again. I was going to say, he's Why, learned the hard way. Right. I mean, yeah. Why am I even going to bother talking to you? Right. Who are you? What's the point? You're not going to be here a year yeah. from now. And, and we were looking lasts. at, well, what is the constant? And you know, mm. what about just being in this moment? It really is touching and so bittersweet because you know yeah. that's probably because of the damage that has been done. Like, I don't want to say he's not resilient. Like damage is like permanent, but because of what he's experienced, he's really had to look at life like that. And yeah, it's kind of yeah. sad and it's beautiful and wow to yeah. be that bright, you know, at that age. But I will tell you that the termination work with that kid Ooh. was really deeply meaningful. I was going to say it was probably really healthy actually to yeah. experience a healthy goodbye. Exactly. You know? Oh, I yeah. love that you just said that because that's Ooh, one of my things, it's right? One of my Saying things goodbye yep. and looking at that that yep. way. And it was really... Yeah. I think reparative for this kid to do it that way. And, and that's okay because right. nothing lasts forever. Right. That's kind of what I at least take from that. It's like I'm learning to value short-term things. And I think what you're talking about here is like, it's that rope analogy. What is that <laughs> that I'm trying to, you're trying to grasp the rope, but it just keeps coming down or something and you cannot right, keep right. up. Right. And that's kind of what mindfulness can feel like sometimes. Like it's this chore or this task where you have to always bring yourself back to the moment. And it's like, if we can just expand that and loosen the range just a little bit, right? it's the whole situation. It's the forest through the trees kind of thing. Like totally. it can be the whole month. It can be the whole year. You're not going to be perfect. You know, you might be changing a diaper and you might dissociate a little bit and that's right. okay. Like that is part of life and experiencing life. 
Yeah. You don't have to be like, oh God, I just was thinking of something else. I need to come back to the moment. I need to stop and smell the roses, you know? Well, and especially for him with a brand new baby, it's mm-hmm. about, I don't want to miss a moment. Right. I don't want to miss a thing. And I don't want to <laughs> miss a thing. <laughs> oh, right. That idea of, I don't want to miss anything. Yeah. I don't want to miss this moment. You're yeah. always going to miss moments. If you think of them mm-hmm. as pinpoint moments like that. Right. That like as if you're one freezing moment. time. Right. Yeah. But if you expand that, and he even said like, you know, a newborn, you only get this for like a couple of weeks and then it's over. Like, mm-hmm. okay. But then that moment is a couple of weeks, not one little right. diaper change. If we're literally just thinking about memory, right? You can't possibly store every single moment into your memory. It's just not possible. You're no. going to take what's important and leave the rest. Right. And that's kind of a beautiful thing because my God, if you remembered every moment of your life, we'd probably all go crazy. There was something that happened to him when he went, oh yeah, I can feel a little less down on myself because if I look at the last two weeks as one moment, oh, then I was present for that. I'm doing pretty good. Like, oh, yeah, okay. Exactly. I think there's pressure. I'm not a parent, but I am very close to parents. And I think there's a lot of pressure to not miss anything like what he's experiencing right now. Cause there's a lot of talk about like, be present, stay in the moment. Right. And like really soak it all up. Right. Cause they're going to grow up so fast. I mean, I feel pressure just thinking that way <laughs> right. and I'm not a parent, but I would right. feel that way with like a puppy. <laughs> it's turning into anxiety. Something that I love he said, this is not what I expected, becoming a parent. Mm-hmm. And he takes that <laughs> mm-hmm. and then almost instantly ties it to mom. And that's where yep. he was getting into the intense love and the crippling love. Yeah. To me, what I'm hearing is, here's a guy who's looking at what his frames of reference have been in his life mm-hmm. for being present, feeling right. loved, right. showing love. Being a parent. Right, being a parent. Mm-hmm. Now that he is a parent, mm-hmm. he's, he's actively, again, reevaluating, going... Mm-hmm. Well, here are my frames of reference, but now I have a new frame of reference. Yeah. And, huh. How maybe this, this is a yeah. little different. Maybe, mm. huh, maybe I can formulate for myself. Right. Which is huge for Drew with his individuation, differentiation journey that he's been on and the healing, the quote unquote healing power of him realizing he is not his parents. Like he is not doing things exactly like they did. He gets to create his own purpose as a father and like right. how he wants to parent, how he wants to support his Uh co-parent, that I think is especially beautiful for Drew in realizing, oh yeah, I'm not at the mercy of my past or my parents, their parenting style. I love that he takes that and goes, well, my brain is telling me that I'm in a much more stable position in my life, emotionally, mentally, physically, and all that, but my emotions are telling me I'm doing something wrong. That's when he was saying like, no, I'm not being supportive enough. I'm not worried about my mom as much as I should. I'm not building this. I'm doing something wrong. You know, I I Mm kind of threw like a lot of these out there. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, well, which one is it? Yeah. And then it's the comparison of, you know, she's the one that carried the child. She's the one that do this. I'm not doing it. So what he's actually feeling is Mm -hmm. that not good enough. Okay. I mean, that's still a thought too. (laughs) That's, it's a thought. Yeah. So what is the emotion there? You think just... God, it's kind of, sometimes it is hard to kind of pinpoint it to an emotion, but it could be, I think, so many mixed if emotions. If only we had like names of these basic emotions <laughs> as like characters in our head oh, that were ruling boy. us what and how we be? did things. I don't it know. It could be anxiety. It oh, could be fear. Yeah. It could be, it could be ennui. envy. It right? could be. <laughs> I mean, it could be embarrassment, guilt. Yeah. I'm surprised guilt and shame weren't in Inside Out. That is weird. Because that's a huge one. Maybe that'll be in the third one. Yeah, I'm sure it will be. They really made a money-making scheme here because you can just keep adding emotions. I mean, look at a feelings wheel. You've got 20 movies there. So (laughs) I had a couple quotes that I really liked. (laughs) He just said, as a dad, he'll watch his partner breastfeeding, doing this, doing that, being a mom, doing what moms have to do. And I'm just kind of (laughs) there. He says, I don't know why I'm like, I probably shouldn't be laughing at that. Right. But it is kind of funny because I think a lot of dads maybe feel that way. Oh, and I'm just here being dad. Like no one needs me really. But it's like, sure they do. Like somebody needs you. You can offer a lot as the partner. I'm not just a dad, obviously any (laughs) co-parent, but oh, wait, oh, wait. This was my favorite quote of the whole thing. I don't even know what context this is in, but he's talking about how some people are going to respond very excitedly about having a baby and then other people <laughs> don't, you know where I'm going with this, uh-huh. and other people don't care. And you're like, yeah, some people are just going to be like, great, your dick works. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> I don't know what the context was for that, but I just thought it was fun. Is that because you're like, 
you don't have to prove anything to people and it's about what you want? Or was it just simply a joke, Doug? Because that's fine, too. <laughs> but I'm wondering if there was a deeper motivation there or intention. Me saying that was like, so what? It's not that big a deal because he yeah. seems to be like, but it really is, but caring. it's this thing yeah. and it, it's it's this. And when something's happening to you for the first time, it's the biggest deal around. And for him, having this baby is the biggest deal. Mm -hmm. And he's thinking about mm -hmm. his parents and like, wow, yeah. if I'm feeling this, this is such a big deal. How come they're not feeling it? How come some people just be like, yeah, yeah whatever, you had a kid. Because right. to him, it's like paradigm shifting. It's everything. Right? Yeah. It is the biggest thing in his life right now. That paradigm shift? Yeah. He even literally says, mm -hmm. there's a paradigm shift in my existential anxiety of mom yeah, and yeah, dad yeah. and grandparents and that, right? Now that he's he's been inspired to deal with mom. He specifically right. says, like, I want to deal with mom. It's been years in the making. We've waited this long. Now he's a parent and he's seeing, you know, he's tying it all together. And he's like, oh God, these relationships are so important. And I've left dirty dishes at like my right. mom's house, right. you know? Right. I love how he made that link because mm -hmm. he's exactly what I'm saying. Like when it's happening to you for the first time, mm -hmm. it's the biggest thing ever. And he's like, now that I see this, mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand how it was for my mom with me. Why wasn't she affected so much by this? Mm. And why didn't she have this paradigm shift? This is what I always come back to. And I know you say some of these conversations don't have to be with our parents or with the person, right? Like some of the conversations, Absolutely. Yeah. which I'm surprised you didn't remind him of, but maybe that's for a future conversation. But what he says, like I left old dishes there, right? And what he means by that is the conversations he didn't have with right, her. Right. And so now they're like in this weird limbo or this place where he's like, I don't know what we are. We're kind of surface level or transactional. And I just don't know what to make of our relationship. You did say to him, like, what can you do about it? He was like, I don't know. And then you said, okay, is that okay? Yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. Sometimes that really is all it is. That process, that conversation you had with him was a little validating because sometimes when I'm sitting across from a client and they're feeling this guilt about their parents, yeah. sometimes I am like, well, damn, yeah, what can we do about it? It is a weird thing. There's well, no yeah. answer. Him talking about, I left all these dirty dishes yes. in, in the sink. Like, yes. right, that's her sink. Okay. He's projecting yeah. how she feels mm -hmm. with these things left unsaid. Right, because I know you said like, well, that's her problem. I mean, if we're looking at your mom, regardless of the dishes, her sink might be clogged. So mm. whatever you're doing to the dishes, if she's got a clogged sink, it doesn't matter. You know, it's not going to get cleaned. How could it? Do you think mom would have to fix the clog? Yeah. Okay. A hundred percent. Because it's her sink. Yeah. It's her okay. sink. She's yeah. got issues of addiction. I'm not getting into mom in terms of like, well, yeah. here's where her addiction comes from. Here's where her sense of failure comes from. Here's where her sense of self comes from. That's her work with her therapist because mm. people will throw their dishes into your sink. Mm. And, and it, is that what boundaries are for? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And you might not Lovely. be able to stop them from putting dishes down in your sink, but you don't have but to wash them. You I, don't have yeah. to take them on. I was just going to say. And if your okay. sink functions well, like, mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. It's not going to clog me. Mm. I don't know. I'm kind of stretching the analogy a little <sighs> bit here, but. <laughs> it really, my brain feels like Laffy Taffy right now being stretched because whew, I right? am naturally so But the, the idea also is what are the things that you have some agency and control over. Yes, right? yes. What can you actually do about it? I always come back to this question too that you framed in, yeah, I think in Drew's sessions of like, well, what kind of son do you want to be? Because right. that's about yep. you, right? Yep. Like who do you want to be? Not yep. how can you control their perspective of you, but who do you want to show up as? Right. right. <laughs> the partially psychodynamic therapist in me. <laughs> Overarching yeah. kind of theme here. There were some moments where I was like, dang, you know what? He kind of sounds like a dad figure right now. Yeah. Like actually very much so sounds like a dad figure to Drew. And I'm just curious what you make of that, Doug. A lot of people will put us as therapists in the father figure, mentor figure, Some mother figure, whatever pedestal. it is. Yeah. Right. Because that's what they need to do. The work that I do, how I approach it, and mm -hmm. you are similar, is that I will try to take on the client's values to yeah. a degree because I'm going to yeah. be reflecting as a version of them. Of course. Yeah. So they think it's me and they think it's external. Yeah. Right? So it's weird. I'll yeah. allow that. I'm not going to fight them back on that, but I mm. will at some point help them to recognize that it really is coming from them. 
How do you right? do that? I mean, you've heard it with Sarah. You've heard yeah. it with Drew. They'll go, I heard your voice in my head. And it was, yes. I was thinking like this, this, this. Yes, like, we've talked about right. this. Uh-huh. That's not me. That's them. Hmm. Yeah, we've talked about that, right? Like, even though it's my voice, in quotes, in your head, it is your thought right. thinking of <laughs> my voice. So it's right. still your thought. If yeah. they need to externalize it and mm-hmm. see it's something apart from them yeah, in order helpful. to internalize it, mm-hmm. fine. Okay, sure. do that. That's a tool, right? Yeah, maybe it feels more helpful or supportive to think that it is someone else's voice. It's the reverse, but very, very similar to when I talk about the Vader voice, the critical mm-hmm. voice in your head. Yeah, I it's guess so. in there and you think it's you. Well, let's externalize it. Let's call it Vader. Mm-hmm. And then let's take it out and externalize it. It's going from both sides, inside right. out and outside in, <laughs> which <laughs> brings us back to the movie Inside Out, which you've got to oh, go see. Good right? job, Doug. Yeah. Do you think that you give him more answers or more just like, well, what about this? What about that? When I was talking about, oh, that's not your sink, right? Because one yeah, of the first things true. she said is, yeah. I disagree. Yeah. Okay. I meant to add that. Yeah. He was like, but I don't see it that way. Like, but it is my problem. It is my sink. Like those are my dishes I left there. Right. But then that's when you kind of are like, I think that's just, you guys had to get to the same language, the same understanding. Right. Right. So I I don't care that he disagreed. I care that now he's talking about the thing, you know, it's sort of like one-on-one with talking to teenagers about feelings and you go, oh, you're really jealous right now. No, I'm not jealous. I'm angry. Like, okay, right. cool. And now we're talking about oh, what you're feeling. I love when clients disagree with me because it's like doubly like, okay, they've identified the truth and they feel safe enough to disagree with me. Totally. It's super totally. cool. Totally. There was so much in this session and so much that yeah. we were doing, yeah, right? That's that, very fair. As, and remember, he just had a kid and he's got baby brain. Yes. Right? Yes. So you're so keeping that in mind. giving him too much at once is going to mm. be overwhelming. And okay. What can we do? The theme of this session to me was Mm -hmm. lukewarm, Mm -hmm. was reevaluating the value of not being at extremes. Okay. So kind of staying there with him and not going into like a low, low that could have been processing the hurt of having surface level. We've talked about this with how I approach Sarah sometimes. Like, Mm -hmm. let's not go too deep into the emotion because once we get off the Zoom, once we're not in session, what are they going to do with this? It's almost a hot take though. It's kind of a hot take that I want to talk about more in the future, maybe, because <laughs> yeah. that's so much of our job is to do emotional processing. Sure. But there's and to a sit in the di- discomfort and to be there for it. It's also hard when you're not in the room and you're on a Zoom. Yeah, that's right. So, so true. feeling their energy and going yeah. with where they are. I've actually parked things that were very emotional until I knew he was going to be in the office with me. Mm, and then we'd go into that. Interesting. Okay. Right? Yeah. Taking him to the emotional place like you've heard with Sarah, becomes about that emotional place. Yes. And I don't want to leave him in that emotional place or in that discomfort yeah. because where he is, I don't think that's okay. Mm. If we have the time to truly process it and the session is going to be about that emotion, mm-hmm. then yes, we're going to go there. And he's okay. gotten emotional in sessions before. How do you know though that it's an appropriate time and setting you know, to go there? Part of it is the time arc of a session. Mm. If you're going to go down there, you got to mm. make sure you come back come up. Back up, yeah. Right, and you can't come back up in five minutes. Mm. That's why the sort of doorknob confession yes. or doorknob revelation oh that clients have is is so frustrating as a therapist because yeah. they kind of drop down yeah. here for a second, uh-huh. and you can't stay there because they're literally walking out the door. Yep. There are some approaches to therapy which you and I have talked about where mm. the therapist will hit something emotional and let their client sit in the discomfort for a week. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's and why that's, I say it's a hot take to maybe not do that. Well, I think it's irresponsible to do that for the sake of doing that if it's going to do more harm than good for your client. Mm, but how do you know if it's going to do more harm than good, right? You got to know your client. Are, but what if it's in the beginning or like you just don't know and like they maybe want if to If it's in the beginning process. and you don't know, don't do it. That's well, irresponsible. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Sure. Okay. You know, to me, part of building rapport yeah. is getting to know my client. Mm. Well, yes. Is that me taking care of them? Okay. Yeah. Well, you're a therapist. Yeah. So like, <laughs> that's kind right? of part of our job, maybe. If it serves them. And sometimes when you do that, the mm-hmm. client won't follow you there. And you have to know, like, am I meeting the client where they are? Mm-hmm. Or am I trying to lead them there and take them there because that's where they Ooh, need to be. And that is irresponsible because then we are acting as the expert and not being person-centered. Right. 
Yep. Right. So I will push without pushing over. I will take yep. them there. And if they can be there, okay, then we'll go there. If not, okay. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm going to mark it, but we're going to move. Cool. I'm going to mark it, but we're going to move. Right. That's cool. Last thing I'll say is just like highlighting his value of, because this really hit him. It's like what I want family to be. Or no, he said that and you reiterated that, right? He said something like, oh, this is just showing me what I want family to be. So when he was talking about his brother and like, yeah, I don't want a book. Yes, right? yes, yes. It's something that you and I talked about yeah. at the beginning of summer when he mentioned something about his brother and you were like, how do you know that that's what he values? Yeah. Because <laughs> he said, yeah. I want the kind of family that's a family. Mm -hmm. I want to know in 10 years from now, we can have a conversation. We'll be okay. And right. it would be nice. He would love if his kid grew up mm -hmm. knowing his uncle. Yeah. That may or may not happen. Sure. But that is a value for Drew. Yes. He would like that. He wants yeah. that to exist. Right. And it's what he can control and all of that. Yeah. A lot yeah. he can't. So mm -hmm. yeah, you might get a book, you might not, but mm -hmm. what is important to you, it's recognizing here's the family I want and what I want to create. And I want to create mm -hmm. those opportunities. Yeah. And here's the family that I've can. got. And yeah. they're not always going to take those opportunities. Yeah. That's what I was saying. You give them a lot of tough love in this session and not in a bad way. I think now you're justifying it and it makes more sense to me. Like he's got baby brain and he can't really go into these maybe softer emotional places. Like sometimes it is just more of a direct statement. Right. right. I mean, that's why like <laughs> to me, I even texted you or, or told you mm -hmm. before we recorded like, wow, yeah. this one's got a lot in it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I hear that as, you know, for you guys listening, you might be going, what? Uh, there wasn't a lot that happened. I know, right? I'm thinking that too. Like, right. But for <laughs> me new. as his therapist, I hear yeah. this and go, ooh, look there's at that. So oh, many there's themes. that. Oh, yeah. so many different places we could go. Yes. We could still go. Yes. So many things we could come back to. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, if you guys want to come back. I knew it. I was going to say, <laughs> I'm out of notes, Doug. I'm ready to wrap it up. Well, let's wrap it up. Come on back, y'all. Come on back. We're Summer back. is over. We're back, baby. We are back. And you can be back with us next week with mm -hmm. a new Drew, a new Sarah, a new Somebody. something. In the meantime, you can hear our voices some more. Thank you for hanging in for a yeah. long one. Yeah. We appreciate you. We do. We're happy to be back. And we'll talk at you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.